Today, we're going to be talking about a very important topic, patient blood management versus transfusion safety. So today, I'm very happy to have Sherry Azawa with us today, um, a leader in patient blood management. Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Sure, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Would you care to um, briefly introduce yourself? Um, sure, and thank you for the uh, introduction already. So um, my name is Sherry Ozawa, as you said. I am uh, originally a critical care nurse by training, but I have spent the last um, 25 years in the field of patient blood management. Um, most of my career spent uh, at Englewood Health in Englewood, New Jersey, where we built um, probably one of the best known and largest patient blood management programs uh, in the world. Um, but for the last 20 years also have been um, a founding member and a leader in the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, which is the only professional society dedicated fully to, um, opt uh, to promoting optimal patient blood management as a standard of care for all patients. Um, so currently president of that organization and very involved in really the um, promotion of patient blood management as a really important safety and quality initiative for patients worldwide. Wow. Well, great. And again, we're so happy with us today. So um, I do have a few questions to ask you, so we'll kind of jump right into it. Um, so patient blood management and transfusion safety are terms that clinicians often use interchangeably. So my first question for you is, you know, what is the difference between patient, patient blood management and transfusion safety? Well, so, you know, I'll start by saying, Sarah, that, you know, both are important. So certainly uh, if patients um, are clinically in need of transfusion, we want that to be done safely. So there's, there's uh, no opposition between the two topics, but really patient blood management has a different focus. Patient blood, management, patient blood management is really patient centered. So we spend a lot, we spend a lot of time in the medical settings, even as citizens talking about blood and transfusion and the availability and the safety of blood and blood components. Um, and patient blood management is in a way in, intending to attack that or uh, disparage that. But really we spend a lot of time talking about the therapy, but really what is the disease, right? So patient blood management really focuses on what happens when a patient's own blood fails, right? Anemia and bleeding and taking the best care of a patient's own blood. So for some patients, um, that might mean that a transfusion of blood components is indicated. But really, for most patients, we're able to do many things to treat their anemia and bleeding and for blood conservation that we really contribute to an improved outcome. And transfusion may not even come up as part of the question. So they really are um, two very separate things, though related. Well, why is patient blood management often preferred to transfusions? Um, and, and how could patient blood management programs reduce the number of transfusions? Yeah, it's, it's really um, a really good question and it's an important one because we want things that are really actionable and things that can be put into operation, right, by healthcare, individual mm -hmm. providers and systems. And, you know, what is wonderful about patient blood management is that it really hits on some of the key quality and safety initiatives that are important to, to healthcare leaders throughout the world. So, for example, uh, taking good care of patients' anemia uh, contributes to shorter lengths of stay, to improved outcomes, to less complications if we treat their anemia, both in the pre-hospital and in the hospital phase, just as an example. Um, if we uh, assertively treat bleeding appropriately and we are really on top of patients who are at risk for bleeding or when they are bleeding, treating it with good goal-directed therapy, with good information, we know that their outcomes are better. That's almost obvious, right? But less death, less complications, better safety profiles, and actually less expense as well. So patient blood management really is a win-win um, for mm -hmm. whoever's looking in any hospital system. If you look at it financially, uh, from an outcomes perspective and a safety perspective, the most important, most importantly, um, but really ultimately a better patient outcome from patient blood management. Um, well, my next question for you is, what are the components involved in implementing PBM programs reliably in an organization? Well, it's like so many things that require change. We're really, okay. when it comes to patient blood management, we're really um, inserting uh, the idea of evidence-based practice around anemia, bleeding, coagulation, and blood conservation in an area where people didn't really think much about it. So there can be mm -hmm. real challenges. So the default position for so many providers for years has been transfusion, 
fixes the problem, right? Transfusion fixes anemia. If the, if the hemoglobin number is low, we can make it higher with the transfusion if the patient is bleeding. Maybe they need a different kind of blood component. And not to say that that's not still clinically indicated for some patients, but what we're really saying is in patient blood management is shift the focus back to the patient and their problem and use an evidence-based strategy to treat those problems. That seems very logical and it's almost common sense, but really in many of these cases, we haven't applied evidence to these areas. So in, in a practical sense, in a hospital or a hospital healthcare system, we need to create that impetus for change. Why, why is this important? What is the driver behind it? Um, and because patient PBM, as we say, say for short, really attaches to many of the initiatives that institutions are looking at, like decreasing cost, like decreasing morbidity and mortality, decreasing infection rates, decreasing length of stay. It really answers all of those questions. It checks all of those boxes um, that we know that it's a win. How to make it happen though, sometimes is a little harder, right? From the idealized picture that we might have to really make it something that and can transpire. So we, we, we know in patient blood management programs that are successful is that there are both clinical and executive leaders who recognize the value of taking this approach, again, for patient safety and quality. Um, and that cultural change can be hard, um, but the ultimate, the ultimate um, achievement of a, a successful patient blood management really program really is worth it. So we need mm-hmm. clinical leadership, executive leadership, and then clinical champions in a variety of different service lines or areas, particularly the ones where bleeding and anemia and, and sometimes transfusion, right, come up very often. So areas like critical care medicine, hospital medicine, anesthesiology, hematology and oncology, trauma surgery, right? These are places where patients are constantly facing these issues of anemia, bleeding, coagulation, getting those folks involved and really looking to the guidance of their own society. So it isn't just Sherry Ozawa and, and Sabam and you know, isolated people, their own organizations, the, Amer- the American Colleges of Surgeons, uh, the American mm-hmm. Society of Anesthesiologists. I you know, can't list all these organizations, but so many of them have spent uh, time and communication efforts uh, through their Choosing Wisely campaigns or in other types of communication uh, to their members to say, this is an issue we really need to look at, right? The way that transfusions are used as a default um, to fix a number instead of really paying attention to what's going on with patients. And if we do that well, we really contribute to the right kind of outcomes that we want. So engaging those clinical champions um, is really critical. Um, also our nursing colleagues and important advocates in, um, in patient education and again, um, patient-centered decision-making, which is really the other pillar of patient blood management. And then the other piece is really helping to create an informed patient population where patients pay attention to their own health status, uh, their own anemia. Almost a third of women of childbearing age are anemic, right? It's the most common medical problem in the world with 2 billion plus people affected, yet we just don't pay much attention to it either as individual women or or men or or patients Mm -hmm but our healthcare providers don't need it. It just sort of seems like a normal part of doing business. So, you know, educating both providers and patients that these, there are, there are aspects to patient blood management, taking care of your own blood or a patient's own blood that we could do much better and thus ultimately make their outcomes when they do have medical, a need for medical intervention or surgical intervention safer and better, or even if they don't, more vitality, more health, feeling better, better outcomes for their their babies and their children. So that's just an example of anemia, but um, really it's, it's a combination of an informed medical group of professionals and an informed patient population. Right, okay, interesting. Um, well, the last question that I have for you is what can interested audiences anticipate in the patient blood management realm in the next few months or even years? I know that there's a lot going on, um, but I wanted to get your feedback on that. Yeah, well, it's a great question. And there's a lot going on around the world in patient blood management. It's very exciting to us who have been at it for a few decades. Um, There are many countries and even continents in the case of Australia and um, the uh, EU that have um, mandated uh, in a positive sense, patient blood management initiatives across countries or continents as uh, important patient safety Mm -hmm. um, and quality initiatives. A number of other individual countries and health systems certainly 
lots of hospital systems around the world. So a lot of um, the appropriate noise around patient blood management and movement by both, again, governmental health agencies, ministries of health, as well as um, individual hospital systems and providers and professional societies of all kinds. And what's also very exciting is um, within the next few months, there will be the release of uh, a document outlining the urgency of the need and, and um, it, it, compelling the member states of the World Health Organization uh, to um, implement organized patient blood management programs. So the World Health Organization will be releasing a, a very clear document that encourages all its member states to do something about patient blood management. It may look different. The implementation is going to be a little bit different from country to country, depending on the culture and the assets and the um, resources, but um, everyone can do something, although it, may, it might look different in different places. Um, no matter what level of economic development a country's at, there are parts of patient blood management that can be quickly and easily implemented uh, to the benefit of their population. So we're really excited about that World Health Organization statement, um, and we really think it's going to be a strong strategy to um, impact people's minds around the world. That's so great. How exciting. Well, good. It sounds like there's a lot of great work that will be coming out and rolling out in the next few months or so. And um, I hope that this you know, interview is very helpful for our intended audiences. But Sherry, before we wrap up, is there any you know, final comments that you'd like to give um, to those that are watching? Um, just to remember that we are taking care of a precious resource, which is the patient's own blood, which is really a liquid organ. Right. And we sometimes don't treat the blood and the endothelium combined really is the, is the organ. Um, we don't treat it that way. We treat it as maybe an IV fluid as healthcare providers. Um, but it's a very precious resource, our own blood. The, the blood that generous people donate, right, as part of the donor system uh, is also a precious resource. Um, but we and patient blood management really focus on what we do with our own blood and treating it as an, an organ system with the same amount of respect and with the same amount of specialization, same amount of research, the same amount of academic integrity when we uh, look into how to treat it better. So just elevating that concept of what blood really is to where it belongs. It's our body's liquid organ and we need to treat, to treat it um, as something very precious. Well, Sherry, thank you so much. I, I can't thank you again for taking the time to speak with me today. And you know, we hope that this interview is very very helpful for our audiences and um, we look forward to all of the great work that will be rolling out soon. Thank you, Sarah. It's been Thank a pleasure you. to be here. Thank you.